So uh, I'd like to welcome you all to one of our Meet the Editors sessions. Um, I was going to say unfortunately, but maybe I should say fortunately. Uh, when we do research, well, the only thing that's left is whatever publications we can uh, make uh, on the basis of those uh, of that research, um, except, of course, the many long-term effects uh, of people reading about our research. So I think this is, uh, in any academic uh, conference, the Meet the Editor session is really a, uh, one of the, the highlights of the event. And um, I'm very glad to say we have a, a distinguished panel of editors uh, with us. And uh, so this is not by alphabetical order of the editors, it's by alphabetical order of the journals. So I'd like to introduce uh, Jennifer Howard Grenville. And uh, Jennifer is the deputy editor of one of the, I guess, main outlets in our field which is the Academy of Management Journal. Um, Jennifer is at the University of Cambridge. And then we have um, Sarah Robinson, who is uh, at the University of Glasgow and uh, who is a co-editor of uh, European Management Journal. Um, then Dermot Breslin, and uh, Dermot is the co-editor in chief of uh, I guess a, a journal with a, a somewhat specific positioning because it's the International Journal of Management Reviews. So uh, it's, I guess, somewhat different from some of the other outlets that we'll, <coughs> we'll be talking to uh, today. And uh, Caroline Gatrell of the University of Hi. Liverpool. Hi. Uh, who is the associate editor of the Journal of Management Studies, which is clearly one of the leading uh, journals based in Europe, uh, so very close to our hearts at, at Eura. Um, without further ado, uh, maybe in the order that was listed in the program, if you're okay, uh, maybe each of the editors could tell us a little bit about the sort of positioning, expectations, uh, submission, um, uh, process, and uh, everything that a prospective author might want to know uh, on these journals. And then we'll leave some time for, for questions. So um, any questions that you might have on your own uh, attempts at uh, publications, I think this is a good moment to uh, to start thinking about them. Um, so, Jen, I think uh, the floor is yours, if that's okay. I don't know if you're using any slides or any supporting material. Well, I'll um, share my screen and my slides um, and just check that everyone can see these. Can you put a thumbs up if you can see? Yes. Okay, yes, great. We can. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. And I'm presenting um, on behalf of the journal, obviously. Whoops, sorry. Uh, got myself forward too far. Um, Laszlo Tiano is our editor-in-chief just now. He's um, at Rice University in Texas, so it would be very early morning where he is. Um, so I'm happy to present on behalf of, of the journal as a whole. So um, I am one of two deputy editors. I'll explain a little bit more about our structure in a moment. But first off, um, what do we publish as a journal? Um, the key message in here from the mission statement is um, our work contributes to management. Um, obviously, it's in the title, but we expect both empirical and theoretical contributions in every paper. So um, we are not a theory only journal. Um, we are not a review journal. Um, we must have empirical um, contributions as well as a significant and novel theoretical contribution to uh, publish research. Um, we are um, receiving a very large number of manuscripts um, annually, and we have just actually closed a special research forum, so this number will be even higher this particular year, probably. Um, we desk reject a fair number, which is standard for large journals these days, just because those that we do receive um, that go up for full review get a very high standard of review from our editorial review board members and ad hoc reviewers. Um, we have what we call sort of a wide tent. So if you are a member of any of the major um, associations and have an interest in management, whether it be micro, macro, all sorts of methods, 
um, as long as it's empirical and making a theoretical contribution, we would welcome it at the journal. Um, I happen to be a qualitative researcher and I handle um, qualitative manuscripts uh, solely. Uh, we do sometimes do have mixed methods, but basically my domain is qualitative um, manuscripts and I have a team of three other associate editors dedicated to handling qualitative manuscripts. Um, that represents the proportion of qualitative manuscripts that we, we receive, um, which is roughly 18 to 19%. Um, and the others are sort of split between micro and macro quantitative papers almost equally. Um, some people say, well, it's hard to publish a qualitative paper in a journal like AMJ, but uh, actually if you look at what gets published, it's about 18% of manuscripts published are qualitative. So you have an absolutely equal chance of publication um, no matter what method or what area your work is in, um, in terms of, of being accepted into the journal. Um, and as I mentioned, we work very hard to get editors across the whole spectrum of topics, theories, and methods. Um, our impact factor is high. It's stayed about this for the last several years. Um, uh, we publish six issues a year. So um, there varies number of papers per issue varies a little bit, but what it means is we have a large number of in-press articles. So if you get a paper accepted today, it might be in press for greater than a year, but of course, like everyone, it'll be up on the website. People can access it and cite it. Um, our acceptance rate hovers about 5%, um, and that includes uh, the desk rejected manuscripts. So it is difficult to get into the journal, um, but it gets highly cited and noticed generally when papers do get published. We have over 300 members um, on our editorial review board and they're chosen for the quality of the reviews, the timeliness, the constructiveness of the reviews, um, and also their own publication record. So um, here's the three of us who are in the more senior roles on the editorial team. There are 23 of us in total on the editorial team. Um, the three of us are the only ones who are um, adventurous enough so far, uh, save the last team to have a second go. Um, we have three year editorial rotations at AMJ. Katie DeSellis and I have both previously been associate editors as has Laszlo Tiani. So, um, and Katie is managing uh, or handling all of the micro manuscripts that come in. Um, Laszlo is handling all the macro manuscripts that come in. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the exact workflow and in a minute or two. I'm not going to talk through everyone here, but these are our associate editor team, um, the other 20 individuals who are handling manuscripts um, spanning, as you see, um, countries, uh, special areas of focus in terms of theory and methods and, um, you know, parts of the world. Um, so that's that's our whole group. Um, a paper that comes in is first um, taken by our, our amazing uh, managing editor, Mike Malgrandi, who's been with the journal longer than any of us can remember. Um, and then Laszlo and Mike um, give the first sort through. Um, Laszlo decides if it's micro, macro, well, Laszlo decides if it's a desk reject um, and sometimes consults with Katie and I on that too. Um, if it's not, it comes forward in the way shown. The key thing from this chart is once I, Katie or Laszlo assign it out to an associate editor, they make the decision. So it's their hands, it's in their hands to choose the reviewers um, and it's in their hands to then make the decision. Obviously we can get into consultation as needed. Um, there are always three reviews. Um, we try to have two editorial review board members on each paper. Um, detailed comments, as I mentioned, are received. Um, and uh, they reviewers also make special comments to us that only we can see, typical of most journals, and then they make a recommendation. But as I mentioned, the associate editors, it's in their hands to make the decision on whether a re revise and resubmit is given. Um, how to not get a desk reject, make sure it's a paper that's suitable for AMJ. Really, this large number of desk rejects can be quite scary when you look at it at first, but we do get, um, as uh, most journals do, probably a fair number of journals, uh, papers that just, you know, they haven't done the basic things of reading the website and understanding what our mission is and understanding what a typical AMJ paper is. So if it's only theory, um, it's just going to get desk rejected. Um, if it doesn't make a novel advance to theory, um, if it's, if it's you know, applying theory to a new case or phenomena, um, unfortunately, we'll get desk rejected because we really need to preserve the time and energy of our reviewers for the papers that have this stand the greatest chance of being recognized as novel and significant in terms of their contribution. Um, people sometimes get a desk edit on a manuscript. This is an opportunity. Actually, it's not bad news. 
Um, this is just where we notice that the paper needs some polishing. Um, often what happens is it's 75 pages long and that's just far too long to send out to review. Everybody thinks their paper, their data, their method deserves more space, but um, we have to keep things fair. So often papers might get sent back. Um, you're asked to remove some pages or put something into an online appendix um, so that it can uh, preserve the, the, the reviewers and the editor's time. Um, we're looking for contribution to length. So that's an opportunity if you get a desk edit, it will come back to us and then we'll send it out to review once you've fixed the bits that you've been asked to fix. Um, main reasons for rejecting a paper that's fully reviewed, um, you can probably guess it's not a novel theoretical contribution. Um, it's very narrow in scope. It's not talking to a readership that uh, represents AMJ. So it might be a very, very arcane or narrow field or focus that people haven't made an effort to generalize. Um, please cut me off if I'm running over time. I've got a timer going, but um, I want to keep to my 10 minutes. Um, so, uh, you know, and often it depends on the method too. There might be a fatal flaw in terms of the method or the data, but you will always get great feedback in order to understand how you might fix and address some of those problems with your research. Um, to improve your chances, definitely, definitely send it out to friendly review. Never let the first people who really read that full paper be the reviewers and the editors. I'm sure other editors would agree. And by friendly, we don't mean really friendly, we mean critical friend. Um, someone who is willing to call out the things that they're not convinced by in the places where they have questions or where there are gaps in the paper. Um, fix those before you send it to us. Paper development workshops, it's harder to be running these obviously in the current environment, but we do make an effort to run these. They will be held virtually, for example, at, at Academy of Management. Um, and we have some other opportunities that we're pulling together um, to do these. So you can get feedback from editors on your ideas or short papers in progress. Um, and make sure you think about your research design. So is it appropriate to answer and address the questions and the theoretical questions that you raise? If it's not, it can be very hard to fix that um, depending on the method as well. Um, Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Um, basically, uh, I will just point out, these are not hard and fast numbers, but your, your goal is to get a revision um, in, any, in any journal or to get great feedback that helps you develop the paper. Um, roughly one in four papers, broad rule of thumb, gets an r, &R opportunity at AMJ. So if you do get that, um, do, do your all because your chances will only eat, increase from there forward on the various rounds as you polish the paper. Um, so I can address more questions about the review process, but just that's a broad overview of the journal. Um, thank you very much for listening and look forward to the other uh, conversations. Thank you very much, Deb. Um, Sarah, would you, would you like to take over? Yes, um, I'll just try and share my screen. And there we go. Can you see that? Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'll just put it on slideshow. It looks like you're in the middle of the show, so you probably. Oh dear. Okay, I'm back. Right. Okay. So good morning. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Robinson, and I'm representing the European Management Journal. This journal um, is. Um, uh, a joint venture between ESCP uh, and uh, University of Glasgow. At the moment, um, the managing, the editor in chief is Minas uh, Kastanakis uh, from ESCP uh, London, uh, and we will rotate back to Glasgow uh, in April, and where I will be become the uh, the editor in chief. And the man managing editor is Joanna Duncan. Um, so. Who are we and what do we do? We're a generalist uh, management journal. Um, we publish papers on a broad uh, topic, a broad spectrum of business and management. Um, we, um, we, we, we publish papers um, that, are, that make a novel uh, contribution to, um, to journal, to um, knowledge in this area. Um, yeah, uh, we um, look for generalizable and interesting um, uh, papers that are interesting to many of our readers, so from across 
section of the, um, the management organization studies spectrum. We also look for papers that are accessible and interesting to non-specialists, either non-specialists in the field or to practitioners. So we do encourage papers that are written in accessible language, that are not too jargon heavy, uh, and that um, people maybe from slightly outside the field or practitioners can uh, access easily and understand easily. And we also encourage papers to have um, some implications for practice, uh, particularly at the end of, of the papers. Uh, we like papers that are empirical contributions, um, that are rich and interdisciplinary, uh, and especially across subject areas within management. Uh, we, we um, again, um, would encourage a theoretical contextualization. Uh, we also encourage methodology papers um, and literature reviews, particularly systematic literature reviews. Uh, theoretical contributions are also welcome. Uh, just to give you an idea of our range, um, here are um, the sections, the, the def different types of associate editors we have from marketing to business ethics to organizational behavior to accounting and finance and all kind of stops in between. Um, so a few little um, statistics. Um, we have a current impact factor of two uh, 0.369, which has increased an awful lot over the last few years. And so we're very pleased with that. Um, what might be of interest to you in terms of um, um, getting a paper published is our review speed uh, and so on. Normally we make a, a desk uh, decision within a week. The editor-in-chief makes those decisions. Uh, and then um, within 16 weeks, we would make a first decision where, from the associate editors um, uh, and then with a final decision within 34 weeks. That's what we try to, to work to. So we are quite fast. We only do two reviews, uh, which does speed up the process a little bit. Um, we have, um, again, our submissions rate has increased enormously in the last few years. We're trending at about a thousand papers a year now. Um, and our reje rejection rate is about 90%, um, with the exception rate, uh, acceptance rate of around 9%. And that's just a little um, um, graphic to show you how our uh, impact rate has increased more or less over the last um, 10 or so years. Um, we had a little, um, the, the slight blip there is because of, of one special issue that was extremely, or the slightly higher in 2018 was due to a special issue, which was extremely well cited. Um, so in terms of our um, readership and our authorship, um, we are a European management journal, and we encourage papers that have some relevance to Europe in some way, or build on European traditions, but we are not exclusively a European journal at all. We, we encourage papers from all over the world. And as you see, our readership is very much um, a global one. Um, what we are working on is that our authorship becomes more global. And we've made, we've done quite a lot in the last couple of years to uh, encourage that. We've increased our editorial board to include more people from Southeast Asia um, and other parts of the world. Um, and, um, and we are already seeing the results in terms of more papers coming in from, from all over the world. So we encourage papers that are written in other parts of the world and that are about other parts of the world, but maybe have some generalization, some generalizable interest to Europe and European management as well. Okay, um, so our review process, we have six issues a year as well. We have one special issue that includes one special issue and one management focus. A management focus is a smaller, it's like a mini special issue where we have three to four papers within a regular edition um, and, um, and an editorial. So it might be um, papers from a conference, for example, um, or from a symposium. Um, our paper, as I said, our papers are screened by the editor-in-chief, 75% are desk rejected, 25% uh, are then assigned to the, a, the associate editors. 
Uh, we have two rounds of reviews normally. We very rarely go to three. We try not to. Um, we have a very, very good reviewing bank um, and we get very good reviews. Again, so, you know, uh, very in developmental reviews. Um, yeah, um, and we would aim to get a, a publication within a year. So it's a good journal to look for if you're looking to get a paper out quite quickly, because we do have quite quick turnaround rates in that respect. So reason for rejection, very similar to what, what Jen has already says, said a lack of contribution, uh, the weak positioning, um, of the paper generally and a weak positioning in terms of the aims of, of the journal itself. Um, a paper that is very um, data heavy, that you've given all your data, but no theory, no theoretical framing. That's kind of often a problem. And it's often a problem we find with early career academics who are publishing from their PhDs, et cetera. Um, a lack of clarity um, and sort of conceptual drifting of papers. And we don't actually publish um, modeling papers. They're the only papers we don't publish in our journal. Uh, we did very much encourage you to write um, a, a clear um, cover letter to the editor in chief because that really helps in, in the um, tirage process um, and in letting us know what your paper is about. Um, we very much encourage early career academics uh, to publish in our journal, particularly if you're starting to publish from your PhD and so on. Um, so we, we support early career academics a lot in this respect. Normally we would do that at conferences. I've given a lot of workshops in conferences in publishing from your PhD, how to get published and so on. We will need to look into doing that virtually if you know, our, our current situation continues. Uh, but in the meantime, we do have some best practice videos that I would uh, encourage you to have a look at on our website. Um, which is an introduction to the journal, then how to avoid desk rejections, what, how, you, how you develop a theoretical contribution uh, and an intellectual contribution, what European means, how you position your paper in that respect, and some advice on creative reading. So please check those out if you're interested in um, submitting a paper for our journal. Um, there is also some ad additional vi uh, advice in our uh, editorial in our editorials. So have a look at those. Particularly, we have a collective editorial, uh, which is nice, which all, all the associate editors uh, contributed to, which um, they were saying what sort of papers they would look for in their field in marketing, in organizational behavior, et cetera. What were the trends? What are the things that, 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 that are current uh, and are interesting that they would welcome papers for? So do have a look at that. That is open access as well. We have a few special issues um, going at the moment. Um, one in progress and two with, with deadlines, mergers and acquisitions and integrating organizational research are live. So their deadlines are coming up. We also have two management focus um, calls out at the moment too. Um, yesterday we announced our best paper award. Um, so um, this is it for this year. Uh, and just you see it's a systematic literature review. Um, and we also have a best uh, reviewer award, which will be announced in January. Again, if there are early career or other people in the audience who would like to start reviewing and would like to review for our journal, please let us know. Um, we support reviewers in the process. Um, so it's a nice journal to start reviewing on if, if you haven't already reviewed. Um, and that's us. We are um, on LinkedIn and we've just recently started on Twitter as well. So please follow us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I think all of this is, is very informative to prospective authors. So uh, thank you uh, both up to now. And um, now I guess is a journal that has a somewhat um, different positioning. So Dermot, I, I guess the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, Pierre. So I'll just uh, share my screen here. Uh, 
Okay, so I'm representing the International Journal of Management Reviews, and I'm one of the co-editors in chief, uh, alongside Katie Bailey, who's at King's College London. I'm at Sheffield University. Uh, so the International Journal of Management Reviews is uh, a generalized journal that publishes only literature reviews um, in any topic really across uh, business and management. Uh, we're review journal, so we have quite a high impact factor. Our current impact factor is 8.63, and that puts us fifth in the business journals globally and in fifth also in the management journals uh, globally. Uh, our downloads have been increasing, as Sarah was saying, with uh, e EMJ as well. Uh, our our uh, downloads are currently over half a million uh, last year. So uh, we're, as I said, we're a management review journal. Um, we publish literature reviews, uh, but literature reviews published in IGMR have to make a theoretical contribution. Um, so like the other two journals you've just seen before, uh, our papers seek to advance theory, but in, in, maybe contrary to the other journals, our papers have to do it based on a platform of a literature review. Uh, so we put forward, let's say, papers might want to shift paradigms in terms of uh, perspectives or put forward new insights, new ideas, uh, conceptual ideas, or used as a strategic platform for new research directions. Uh, but all of this, as I said, has to be based on a thorough review of the field. So what makes IJMR distinct? Uh, first of all, we're a review journal, as I've said. Uh, the second thing is uh, we are, let's say, agnostic in the approach that's taken to complete a review. Um, so unlike, let's say, annals, Academy of Management annals, that promote, let's say, the integrative review, uh, we, we publish papers across, right across the spectrum, uh, as I'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, all our papers have to make a conceptual contribution. And again, here we're pluralistic in terms of the type of contribution and in terms of how we define theoretical contribution itself. Uh, so that could be right, sort of a higher level uh, advancement of theory are much more specific in terms of developing aspects of a particular theory. Uh, we encourage papers that are also interdisciplinary. Uh, you know, we're all management scholars. We're looking to study the world of management and practice, and those problems are interdisciplinary. So we encourage papers that cut across disciplines, uh, and, a, and indeed some of our most cited and more innovative papers that we've published in the past uh, tend to cut across more than one discipline, one, one domain. So let's say in summary, we're a global uh, generalist and pluralist uh, journal that publishes literature reviews acro right across the spectrum of management and organization studies. So one way of, uh, I was just thinking before this presentation, and I did another presentation yesterday, uh, about how I might represent uh, IGMR, and I've tried to use a metaphor here. I like using metaphors. <laughs> and uh, so if you're doing a literature review, let's say you look, you, first of all, you have to think about what it is you're going to, you're going to represent. Let's, you know, let's use it. The, the metaphor of the artist. So the artist in this case will look at the Houses of Parliament, lots going on there at the moment, you know, frantic negotiations with the EU at the moment. Uh, and we've got Westminster Abbey behind, Westminster Bridge and the, and the Thames. Now any artist could, you know, as a, as a literature review scholar, you have to set your frame and your discipline and identify what it is that you're going to review, just like an artist does. But every representation will be different. So for example, Canaletto, you know, the Venice from the Venetian school will have one representation you know, from the 1700s. Pissarro, you know, the, the Danish French uh, artists will have a different representation, picking out different things in that landscape, representing it in a very different way. Uh, Monet and Turner, you know, we move on to the sort of Turner, much more of the romantic uh, style of uh, painter, you know, expressing exactly how he felt when he was painting that picture. So a literature review scholar is very similar to what goes on here. You have to set your frame. You have to identify what it is that interests you in that frame. You have to very, more importantly, sell that interest to the reader. There are many different styles and methods, not just a systematic literature review. There are many different ways of doing a literature review. And if you do them, you have to adopt a certain method that might be similar to other people in your school uh, in your particular discipline. You're representing a field, but in a particular way. And it's that perspective and that interpretation that is the contribution of your work. 
you know, the impression that you leave in, in the reader's mind and the thing they take away from your review is what your contribution is. And what we would say at IGMR is there's no one particular way of doing it. You know, we are open to many, many different ways of representing a field. Uh, so, and I suppose, you know, the literature review, it, it should be something that something will, that, you know, the reader will have a very simple takeaway when they, when they leave, a very simple understanding of the field in a very different way that can launch future directions and, and, and different ideas uh, for theory development. So just to summarize, um, you know, what are the things you need to consider to publish an IGMR? Uh, well, first of all, just as I said, you have to identify what your field is and put boundaries on it. Uh, you have to, uh, you know, consider is the literature mature enough, for example, or is it emergent? If it's emergent, could you, for example, draw on another literature to, to support, you know, the development of theory within this emergent literature? Uh, is your review differentiated from another? You know, a common question I get as an editor in chief is, uh, you know, have you done a review on this before? You know, I would just say, you know, similar to the, the, the previous slide, there are many, many painters have painted the River Thames and the houses of the palaces of Westminster, but each one is completely different. And that's, that's what I would also say to a prospective uh, uh, author that wants to publish with this. Uh, is the review up to date? You know, clearly the review in itself should add value in, in addition to the fact that, it, that it, it has some sort of conceptual contribution. So someone should be able to go to the review and get an up-to-date picture of what's happened in the field. Okay, that picture may have nuances and a different type of representation for each author, but it should still be up-to-date. Um, are there reasoned authoritative conclusions as to the current way of thinking? Well, I would say that each author will put a particular slant and a particular uh, interpretation on that literature uh, and in the way that, uh, that they're critical of that literature, and this is also a very important thing, we do get a lot of reviews that we reject that are quite descriptive in the sense that they repeat what the original author has said. Uh, we want our reviews to be more critical and to dissect and unpack what is happening in the literature. And it, it all goes to this final thing that you know, the review should be selling some core idea, and that idea should be advancement of theory in a particular manner. Okay, so, uh, you know, these are our details in terms of contacting us, but if you are a PhD or early career scholar, we would welcome manuscripts. Uh, we do publish early career and PhD uh, student uh, literature reviews quite, quite frequently in IGMR, so, uh, so that's IGMR. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dermot. Uh, I learned a lot about the journal, but I wasn't expecting to learn about uh, painters and the Houses of Parliament. So uh, I guess even better. Uh, thank you very much. Before we move on to Carolyn, maybe just uh, ask uh, participants in, in this session, if you have any questions, and uh, you feel up to sort of writing them briefly in the chat, please go ahead. It'll allow us to prepare for our, our discussion uh, afterwards. Um, I think it will be okay to also raise your hand. There are not too many of us that this will not be uh, unmanageable, but uh, if, you're, if you're okay with writing it down, uh, it, can, uh, it can allow us to, to, to move on and I can uh, uh, read out the questions to, to our, our editors if, uh, if you can send them to me. Not send them to me, just put them on the, on the chat. Uh, Carolyn, uh, last but not least, uh, maybe you can talk to us about uh, um, the Journal of Management Studies, which is, again, one of, one of the, the figures in our field. So uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Caroline Gattrell. Uh, I'm a professor of organisation studies at the University of Liverpool. And at the moment, I'm an associate editor with the Journal of Management Studies. I've just been appointed as a general editor. So I joined the general editor team in January 2021. So I will share my screen with you. Yeah. 
I'm hoping that everybody can see the slides. Um, Sarah, can you wave at me if you can see them or put a thumb up? Brilliant, thank you. So I'll just go through um, the topics I'm going to talk about, which are who we are at JMS and what kinds of articles we publish, what we look for in a paper and how you might get past the editor's desk in JMS. As the other um, editors have discussed, I will talk about the common reasons for rejection and a little bit about the outcomes and what to do if you get a revise and resubmit. And then I'll show you a slide of the editorial team and we can all sort of symbolically wave at everybody. Uh, so the Journal of Management Studies is quite long established. It was established in the 1960s with a mission to publish original, innovative and high quality papers that are interdisciplinary quite often and with a strong theoretical orientation. I think in 2020 we will have about 1200 submissions. It might be that that's a slight underestimate. It perhaps is between 12 and 1400. Um, and we have three general editors, which is basically the same thing as an editor in chief and presently nine associate editors and we're based across Europe and North America. We're really fortunate in JMS that we have a very strong editorial office, which is located in Durham University and managed by Margaret Turner. And they offer us as editors and indeed authors a very personal service. So if anybody has a question, the office will help you. At present, I think we must be one of very few journals remaining that operates um, an email submission process. That will change in 2021. The volume of papers that are submitted is just too great for that. So we are going to uh, go online and uh, the process will be follow one from probably about March 2021. Um, we have an impact factor of just under five and we're ranked um, AJG4 and we're in the FT top 50. So what kinds of articles do we look for? Um, well, I think the ones that will be of most interest this morning are regular articles, that's the bulk of our content, uh, submitted on an ad, ad hoc basis. They could be about any topic area. They might be empirical or conceptual. They might be submitted to a special issue. The other kind of um, paper that we publish is review articles. Um, I think Dermot's already explained quite a bit about what those are. Uh, we have a very broad approach. They can be an overview of a particular area of literature with implications for future research. And we're, we're very open to any topic area as long as it's linked with management studies. I've just put in italics the other kinds of articles we accept, which are JMS says and point counterpoint. I'm not going to talk about those this morning. They tend to be often invited papers by senior scholars who are making a kind of commentary on the field. So I think they're probably of less interest in terms of what we're talking about today. I'm talking about morning. It probably isn't morning for most uh, colleagues on the screen today, but it's morning for me. So um, what are we looking for? Well, JMS really welcomes unusual, surprising, quirky or challenging papers. Quite often, those are likely to uh, have an interdisciplinary base. And we definitely look for a strong theoretical orientation. That doesn't mean we're not interested in implications of practice, we are, but that would have to be um, based on a theoretical contribution. And I think we're looking for papers that speak to the JMS readership. I'll talk a bit more about this, but these are papers where the authors have engaged with what the journal is about. So they might be quite critical in approach. They might be producing a different perspective on a field that's discussed in the journal, but from a different angle. But something that's not abstract, but really bears in mind who eventually would read the paper at the end. So how would you get past the editorial desk? Um, I've been trying in my head to work out exactly what our acceptance rates are, and I'm thinking it's probably about five to 6% overall. Um, getting past the editor's desk is a good start. Um, how would you do that? First of all, it sounds really obvious, but pay attention to the author guidelines and read the journal. If you look at the journal, it's very evident that papers in JMS are reflective, they're critical, they draw heavily on the relevant literature. They're quite often about 12,000 words in length. So as a starting point, something that's a lot less than that 
probably isn't covering all the angles that need to be covered in a JMS paper, so it probably won't get through the editor's desk. Has anyone else published in JMS on your topic area? They don't, it doesn't have to be the case, but if it has, it's useful to know that and you can start up a conversation and build upon the topics that have already been discussed. Make sure your paper delivers on its promises. So often the promise in an abstract looks really exciting, but somehow it gets lost in the narrative and the paper doesn't actually do what it says that it's going to do. Demonstrate methodological rigor, methodological rigor. That's one of those things that editors say. What I mean by this is to really open up, if you like, the black box of what you did. And if there are problems in what you did, then rather than try and sort of smooth them over, talk about them. So if you had ethical issues in um, writing your paper, say it was an autoethnography and you were worried about confidentiality, write that into the paper share it with the editor. That's interesting to other academics. How did you overcome those issues? And it also means that the editor is reassured that you've actually um, undertaken your research with rigor and really thought about what you were doing. It's really important to remember that JMS is aimed at a general management studies audience. So it's important for an author to make a convincing case for why their arguments are relevant to our general readership. So often, an author is completely caught up in commitment to their very particular area of research. But it's important to be able to share with the general readership and indeed the editor why that's relevant to general management studies. So an example would be a paper on vaccination programmes could be relevant to a management studies audience, but you'd have to make a strong argument for why that was and where the links are and how management studies scholars might think differently about vaccination programmes having read your paper. This sounds obvious and maybe a bit cheeky, but if something's borderline and it's kind of reasonably competent but really dull and not speaking to the readership, it's less likely to get through than where a paper is lively and interesting. And I think to make sure that your paper is interesting to an audience beyond your immediate area of concern, it's important to get other people to read it. And perhaps people who aren't immediately bound up in what you're doing. Is it interesting? Can they see the connections? Can they see why it's important? One of the reviews that I read of a particular paper said, when I started reading this paper, I thought, what does this have to do with management studies? By the time I finished reading it, I thought this has everything to do with management studies. So those authors who are writing about um, family practices had really convinced the reviewers that there was something in this paper that was relevant to a management studies audience. And check the spelling and grammar. Really important to just spend the extra time doing that. Why does a paper get rejected? Often it's because it's not clear what the contribution is. That's about really reading your paper through and perhaps deciding yourself what it is, finessing it, and perhaps putting it right at the top of the paper a lack of the methodological rigor that I was talking about. Perhaps you haven't explained what you did and why you did it. Lack of a clear and appropriate theoretical framework. We don't really know what it was that underpinned the research. We don't really know what the implications are for theory or practice. That's something that comes in the discussion part of the paper and it's important. I was saying it's important to read the guidelines. Well, it's really evident as an editor, if somebody hasn't read the author guidelines and don't really know anything about JMS or what it publishes, so their paper is just not within our remit, which is a great shame because an author might have spent a huge amount of time writing a 10,000 word paper. It just doesn't fit for JMS. So it might be better focused on perhaps a health journal or something different. It's really key that you link your research explicitly to management and organization theory. Don't leave it for the editor to infer that, but state it. And I think one of the key reasons is that it's just unclear why readers of JMS should be interested in the arguments made within the paper. It stands separately somehow from the journal and you have, the author hasn't made the arguments for why it should be embraced within the remit of JMS. And then finally, the presentation of the paper can be, I, I'm, I'm often astounded. Um, there are some authors who've really, really read through very carefully and they send in a very polished paper and I don't mind the odd little mistake. I'm not somebody who's very conscious about spellings and whether an I is dotted and, and a T is crossed. 
But sometimes the presentation of the paper is such, I can't send it to, to reviewers, even if the ideas are interesting. I have papers where there are different typefaces, different fonts, cut and paste that have gone wrong. And that means you could have something brilliant and really creative, but I can't possibly send that out to somebody, a senior colleague, and ask them to review it. So it would get rejected on that basis. So what happens when your paper comes out of the editor's desk? It might be rejected. But if it is at JMS, you will get detailed feed up, feedback to help you understand why and give you a hint as to perhaps what you might do with the paper in future. You might be invited by the editor to revise your paper and send it back for them to reconsider it. If that happens, really try and follow their advice. What they're trying to do, they've seen something in your paper that's a bit special. They want to send it out to review and they want to give it its best chance. They can predict sometimes what the reviewers will say. So there's one paper that I have in my sort of editor's um, desk at the moment, and it has gone out for review, but the reviewer, the, the authors wrote back to me and said, we don't really want to make these changes. So I thought, okay, I'll give it its chance. It's gone out to review, but I, and I will see what comes back. But my guess is that the first thing that the reviewers will say is, well, this doesn't work for us. If the paper goes out for review, um, as Jen was saying, this is a great result. It means that there is a possibility of the paper getting published and you can stay in the process. Um, when it comes back, reviewers might recommend reject, but if they revise, they, are, they ask you to revise and resubmit your paper, um, you've got a good chance. You'll probably have three reviews with JMS. Um, and if you get the chance to do a revise and resubmit, if the reviewers have recommended that the paper continues, and the editor suggests that you have another chance to revise, it, to revise it, really read carefully the advice from the reviewers and make sure that you address each point that they've made. The editor will offer guidance and when you resubmit the paper, include a cover note explaining how you address each point. So I think it's about really making the most of that chance. If the editor and the reviewers offer you the chance to revise your paper, have a really good go at that. And take the time you need. If you need more time than you're offered, write to the editor and say can have a bit longer. Um, so this is just a brief shot of our editorial team. And um, we now have a social media editor, uh, Chris Wickett, who is going to really support our authors in trying to um, publicize their papers and hopefully enhance their citations. Um, so those are the uh, resources that we use, but in fact, we're now really very proactive on uh, social media. So, um, so thank you. I think that's it. So let me keep the button on share. Stop share, there we are. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. I think this was um, very informative, very interesting. Uh, I have lots of questions, but uh, I think we should give it over to the floor. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hand, unmute your uh, microphone and fire away if I can put it that way. Hello, hi. Humberto. Hi, I, I, um, thank you everybody for, for the presentation, it's very clear. I have two questions. One is from Jen Howard. I was surprised by the acceptance rate of conditional acceptance at 80%. Uh, after being accept, uh, conditionally accepted, only 80%, I would have expected 95% or something. Can you elaborate a little bit more why 20% of the of the papers that were conditionally accepted were rejected at the end? That will be uh, something that I, I'm just curious to know. And to the other editors, I, I saw that Sarah gave us an approximately length of how long it will take from from being a not test reject to the first review. If if the other editors could tell us a little bit on average how long it will take to get the the the, the this first review. That's all my questions. Thank you, Umberto. Um, I think, um, you know, I need to check on the 80% because you're right that normally if it is conditionally accepted, um, it's very likely to be published. So I do not think that we reject 20% that are told conditional acceptance. That might actually be third R&R. &R. Like other journals, we don't have a particular 
uh, rule. We want the paper to develop as it develops. We try not to go too many rounds of review. And so two, two major revisions would be typical. What we also do because our uh, reviewers are you know, very, very busy is sometimes an editor will make the choice to conditionally accept a paper, but then actually ask for quite a lot of work from the authors. So polishing, um, you know, further elaboration and that kind of thing. Um, so the conditional acceptance in our case releases the reviewers from the process because they've get given their full input and it enables the um, uh, associate editor or editor to work directly with the authors. Um, so it, I would need to double check that figure. I'm, I'm, I apologize because I do not think that you should take it as, as alarmingly as it sounded, um, but just know that sometimes conditional acceptances do not mean that you're done and there's quite a lot of work to continue, but we've heard everything we need to from the reviewers. Um, so it's, it's it continues to be a developmental process. Thanks for clarifying though. Okay. Would you like to, uh, I guess Sarah was, uh, was very explicit, but maybe would you like to say anything about the, the duration of the review process and how it works? In, it's in my case, uh, or in the AMJ case, um, we aim for and we achieve um, under 60 days of, uh, on average, for hearing back um, from first submission. So from the time the paper is accepted into Manuscript Central, um, we get back to you within 60 days. Now, obviously there's a range on that, but um, we work very, very hard to get timely reviews and um, our, our reviewers have about 30 days to conduct their reviews. And so um, that's one of the key things. And obviously as the revisions take longer, um, you know, it can go a little higher, but we were basically hitting under 60 days for each round of review. And as somebody else mentioned, um, please, if you need more time, especially in the current context, um, take it, ask for an extension. We'd rather get a better paper than a fast paper, um, ultimately back from you if you have a revision opportunity. Thanks. Thank you. Caroline, would you like to say something about the... Yes. Um... So I think for us, uh, JMS, one of the things that will assist us is moving to Scholar One. Um, at the moment, we would also be aiming for, for sort of three, four months. Sometimes it has taken longer than that. There are reasons for that. I mean, I don't think that the present situation has helped. So people are taking longer to get around to actually do reviews. Um, but um, we, we would be aiming for three to four months, but I, I have to be honest, I do know that in some cases, one or two cases just lately, an example would be three reviewers say they'll do it, one does, two don't, the office gives up on the two, they write to two fresh reviewers, they have to give them a little more time, so the whole thing takes longer than we might otherwise have chosen. And I think with JMS, it has been tricky for authors because they can't see on a dashboard where their paper is. So as I've mentioned, our office is incredibly helpful and friendly, so you can always drop them a line. But from March, at least you will be able to see, because we'll be on Scholar One, and you can actually see what's happening with your paper and that it's in the review process. Now, having said that, sometimes we take a little longer than we might have chosen. As mentioned before, JMS is also quite generous with things like extension as they understand that things take longer than you thought so it might take a little while to get the reviews back but on the other hand if you the author need a little bit more time the journal is quite understanding about that as long as you I think always the thing is to be in touch with the office so if you're worried about where is my paper where is it in the review process drop them a line somebody will answer and find out for you if you're worried about the fact that you are late with your paper drop them a line. I think, I think that's the key really, that um, even when we go on to Scholar One, the big thing is we have got on office, they are happy to answer queries. So it's about actually talking to the office. They will tell you what's happening. Thank you. Dermot, would you like to say? Yeah, very much the same as what Jennifer and, uh, and Caroline were saying. Um, you know, we, we aim, authors usually get the reviews back within about 30 days a month, but because as Caroline was saying, it takes, it might take a few goes to get the right reviewers and to get the reviews back. So that stagger 
results in about uh, two to three months. It's usually about three months before we get back with the, the first rounds of reviews. Uh, the desk review in IJMR, about 80% of our papers are desk rejected, but we get back within five days for the, so the desk rejects are carried out by Katie and myself. But, uh, but for the first review, it's three months maximum, but I usually well within that. Okay, thank you. Sarah, did you want to add anything to what you'd already said? Okay. So while you all think about your other questions, I'd like to maybe get some clarification from, from all of you. Um, I guess a few years back, it was very unusual to hear about um, reject and resubmit. Um, it seems to be a new procedure that has slowly emerged uh, in our field. Uh, now I hear many colleagues saying, oh, I got to reject and resubmit. Uh, and I think there still is a lot of, uh, uh, I, not misunderstanding, but sort of uh, uh, lack of clarity on what exactly this means and what it implies. In particular, one of the questions that comes up is, does it mean I'm going to get a new set of reviewers? And I have heard, uh, I guess, the, the urban legend, but it may be the truth, that uh, reject and resubmit is when the editor wants to change the reviewers because there's some sort of a misfit that has uh, become clear in the, in the first round. Um, I've also heard that it's some, sometimes you should resubmit to the same associate editor I've also heard that it's an opportunity to change associate editors. So there are lots of possible interpretations. And I think, uh, I don't know, maybe it's only me, but uh, many of my colleagues seem to share that feeling. Um, there's a lot of ambiguity on what exactly is expected when it's a reject and resubmit. Could you, could you tell us a little bit more about this particular decision? And I don't know who wants to go first. Do you want me to start? Please. I think, I mean, I think that's a really, really good point, Pierre, because it depends. So when papers come into me as an associate editor, um, I have the opportunity to decide, this will be the same when I become a general editor, to decide what to do with the paper. I can decide whether it's going to be rejected because it's not suitable for JMS. I can decide that it's going to go out to some reviewers because it might be suitable for JMS. And sometimes there are some papers that fall in the middle there. And I think there is something in this paper, but if it goes to review in its present state, I don't think it will survive. And I don't want to ask the reviewers to do the work on the paper when I know it's not sufficiently developed. So as an editor, I would write back to the author and say, this has some interesting ideas, but it's insufficiently developed for me to send it out to review. And these are the things I would like you to do to the paper. You do them and I'll have another look. And if I think it's suitable to send to review, then I'll do that, but I'm not promising. And that can range from anything uh, such as, you know, you really need to sort out the spelling and the grammar to um, you just haven't been clear about your theoretical contribution. And I would give some very clear instructions and guidelines as to what I think the person needed to do. It would come back to me. There would be no question. In JMS, um, we're quite strict about what editors may do. So, uh, for example, if it's somebody that I know well because I've written with them before or I've taught with them very closely, I would it would either not come to me or I would have to declare that interest and it would go to another editor. Other than that, once it's with me as an editor, it stays with me. There would be no reason for it to go elsewhere. Uh, and it would be very, very unusual in JMS for an editor to change the reviewers because they didn't like them. So um, really, once it's in the system, it's in the system and it's either going to stay in the system and eventually get accepted or it might be rejected along the way because the reviewers and the editors don't feel that the paper is sufficiently developed um, to make it into the journal. So for us, the reject and resubmit would be at those early stages when it comes into me as the editor, it sits on my desk and I'm trying to decide what to do with it. And this is really about giving the authors another opportunity to revise the paper before it goes to the reviewers to give it the best possible chance of getting through the system. 
but I can't think of any other situations where a paper would be rejected, uh, but but the authors would be asked to resubmit it. So just that clears our things up a bit from JMS's perspective anyway. Sure. So you're saying that reject and resubmit is at the editorial desk stage. In our case, absolutely. It's at the editorial desk stage. So I guess they're not represented here, but there are some fairly prominent journals that do have uh, reject and resubmit after the first round of review. So maybe you don't do it or maybe you do, but if you had any, any comments you could make about that, that would be useful as well. Um, Jen, do you want to say something? Um, we uh, at AMJ, we do not have a reject and resubmit uh, uh, provision. Um, and it, if the paper is rejected, it's rejected. Um, the um, you know, and, and if it's a high risk revision, then it's given a high risk revision. So there's no guarantees on invitation for a first round of revision, obviously. Um, but we have chosen not to do um, reject and resubmit because uh, people should give us their best possible paper to begin with, um, and they get one chance if it's fully reviewed. Um, and the only way a paper could come back is as a completely different paper. So the data would have to be different or expanded um, and the theoretical positioning and the argument and the theoretical contribution would have to be significantly novel. So um, we pay a great deal of attention to prior submissions to the journal and you're asked to, because we use Manuscript Central and I think many other journals will do this too, um, you're asked to indicate and upload any paper that might have drawn on the same data set um, or a subset or an extended version of the same data set. And we scrutinize those before anything goes out to review. Um, we also search and see what prior submissions have been submitted by those authors. So if they, for some reason, haven't disclosed a prior submission, we will find it um, and we will look at it before it goes out to review. So, so one of the reasons papers are desk rejected is because authors haven't been um, clear about the fact that, that there was prior work considered at the journal on this. So we're, we do not do reject and resubmit because there's so much demand for journal space. I think we can see from the number of papers everyone is handling, um, it's just not fair. And so that's our, that's our position on it. So, but um, we, we do also have a process, the desk edit process is our sort of process for considering less whether we want to send it back for a revision, but more just if we want to send it back for some tightening or polishing, usually because of length um, that the paper needs to address. So it's a small, it's a small bit of sort of tweaking, um, but that's prior to full review. So after full review, we don't have um, reject and resubmit. Thank you very much. Sarah, Dermot, anything to add? Yes. Um... Thank you. Just to say that we don't officially have um, a, a revise, um, a reject, uh, and resubmit either. However, we do do it um, on a on a on a case by case basis at both levels, but both at the desk reject level. Um, and I think it's often if the paper is not developed enough, um, because we do get a lot of papers that are just not developed enough, but have good ideas, and we say, please go away and you know um, and, and get, basically get this paper up to shape a little bit more and then we might be and, the, and then resubmit it accordingly so that's the first thing um also one thing we do sometimes at um at the desk level is that if a paper comes in that is very interesting but isn't quite a theoretical paper or empirical paper but might be a more kind of philosophical paper um, we might we might invite that paper to be developed as a reflections on Europe uh, piece, which is a, a specific uh, piece in our journal where the editor or editor in chief uh, invites a paper that gives some ideas around, you know, how um, um, something around um, on a topic relating to European management or how European management ideas have been applied to another context. So that's another reason why we might do that. And then that would be the editor would take charge of that paper. Um, it would be an invited paper. Then um, for the um, 
after, after first review, um, we do sometimes do that um, if a paper has a long way to go. Again, perhaps if we think it's by an early career or PhD scholar and the, the reviews are positive in one sense, that they like the ideas, but very critical in, in terms of the presentation, etc. And in that case, I would write a letter very much like, like Caroline described, um, which would point out, you know, what needs to be done in order for this paper to go forward in, in the review process. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dermot, anything to add? I don't know if... Yeah, we're, at AGMR, we're more or less the same as all the other journals. We don't do re reject and resubmit after the first round of revisions. Or sorry, the first round of reviews. Um, at the desk, we may occasionally... Uh, we call it unsubmit rather than reject and resubmit. So we unsubmit if we think a thing, a paper really has potential, but there's just a, some uh, issues that they can address before we send it out. But uh, we don't do it after the first review, no. Thank you very much. So Anjali, you've unmuted. Does it mean you would have a question? Yes. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone, for the great presentations. My question is specific to JMS and hence to Caroline. So um, while uh, making the decision of desk reject, do you have any considerations uh, for papers which are specific to a particular region? Like I'm from India and many of the times I see that the papers are rejected. Uh, I definitely, it must be because of the quality and I'm not saying that because of the region. Uh, and the second part of this question is when the region specific papers come and when they go to the review process, are, uh, is it, is it uh, you know, whether the reviewers are chosen uh, on the basis of their understanding of that particular region? So for example, if I give the example of trade unions, specific trade unions, specific practices in India. So I don't think people would be um, very comfortable reviewing those papers if they don't uh, really know about the context. So is it taken care of while selecting the reviewers of a particular paper? Um, so, I mean, the, the rejection rates with the journal of management studies are, are quite high. Um, so we probably accept about, I'm thinking about five to 6% of papers from, from, from what comes in, that, that's probably about what's published. So um, in general, it's not easy to get a paper published in JMS. So what I've been trying to do today is to share with you how it, how it is possible to do it. Um, no, I, as an editor, I would never look at where somebody comes from, where they're working. I really try and look absolutely at the paper. And in fact, what I do is I read the paper before I look at any details of, of who's written it or where they come from. Um, when I'm choosing, and I think it's probably easiest to talk about this from a personal perspective, when I'm choosing three reviewers, I am bearing in mind the general readership of JMS. So if it's about trades unions, wherever the paper might be located, it would have to be comprehensible to a reader wherever they were living, wherever they were doing, whatever their um, academic background was. So I'd be looking for reviewers who have expertise in the theoretical area that the author was writing in. And what I'm looking for is a paper that speaks to the readers of JMS. So it doesn't really matter in a way what the context is. What really matters is the paper's making a theoretical contribution that speaks to a general management studies readership and that speaks beyond the very specific and perhaps quite narrow area of concern, but relates the area of concern more broadly to management studies. And that is what I'm really looking for in a paper. Can these ideas speak to the readership? Are they critical? Are they looking at this area in a way that might make readers think differently about what they're doing, whatever their topic area is? So that's what I'm looking for in a paper. I don't know if that specifically answers your queries, but, but that would be the way that I would go. And choosing reviewers is, is not straightforward because I might choose the three perfect reviewers and it might be, for example, 
that they are already engaged in reviewing something else for the journal. So we don't want to overburden them. So I have to choose somebody else. Sometimes they might decline. So that's why it takes sometimes a little time because actually this GMS as a journal would go to a lot of trouble to try and make sure that the reviewers are people who are going to be interested in what it is that they're reading and will have a view on what they're reading that's helpful so that whatever they make, whatever their decision, they're making comments that are helpful and developmental to the author. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? The questions shouldn't be coming from me, though I would have many. So I I guess if no one is stepping in, I do have another question, which is obviously um, one of the big reasons to publish, I mean, it's to make our research known, but there is a career sort of uh, career issue associated with, with publications. And uh, obviously each author has to do their homework and figure out how different journals are perceived and viewed at their own institution. But can you tell me a little bit more about, or can you tell us a little bit more about how, um, I mean, how do journals proactively, I know there is a, a sort of a reconsideration of the Financial Times list underway right now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, how do journals proactively um, deal with this issue? So I'm guessing it's not a question primarily for Jen because I think AMJ um, clearly sort of doesn't need to worry about that too much, but you never know. Um, Caroline, I think JMS is often sort of one of the top journals, but is there anything that we can, um, so in particular for EMJ, um, is it a clear sort of, uh, how can I say, uh, would most schools look at it as a pure research journal? Would it be sort of research and practitioner oriented, which you sort of uh, hinted to in your presentation? How would we sort of um, view that and, and someone who would want to send out a manuscript how should they take these things into consideration, including when they talk to, I guess in my experience, deans know their own field, they don't always know their colleagues' fields. So even if there is sort of a, an accepted uh, evaluation of different outlets, uh, a little bomb bit, bit of an explanation is often needed uh, either in different committees or when you submit a package and so on. This is also a question, I guess, for uh, for Derma, because I guess being a what I'll call a somewhat non-traditional sort of format, how how do you deal with these issues? What sort of suggestions would you make uh, to colleagues who who would like to publish but are worried about you know how will this be viewed in a promotion file? How will it be viewed for advancement and so on? So I guess it's mainly a question for Sarah and Derma, I guess. So. Okay, thank you. Um, right. Um, so I think um, the firstly impact factor of our journal has gone up considerably in the last few years. So I think that is something to look at and that um, is one reason why we have had um, such an increase in um, the submission of publications. So I think impact factor is important and it's going up. Um, in, in the listings, we're generally a B or um, um, a, a two star. Um, again, that is something we're very, I think we're on the cusp now and within the next two to three years that this will be really my job as the editor-in-chief um, to, to get it across 
um, into um, a, a four star, a three, sorry, a three star um, grading. And I think we're very, very close to that. Um, so that's one thing. Um, as I've said earlier, we expect papers um, from early career scholars who are perhaps not ready to submit to some of the um, four star, uh, et cetera, journals. Um, and we give a lot of developmental support in that. So I think that's one thing that not everybody can always publish or has the has the um, have the papers that are ready to go into certain other journals. So I think we, you know, we are clear in our positioning on that. However, I think we're at the top of the two star kind of category at the moment, and we will be going up in that respect. And, and papers uh, and, and journals in three star um, rankings have lower impact factors than we do uh, at the moment. Um, I think it's, it's a good, journal I think in terms of developing your writing and developing your writing in terms of um, being able to to write clearly for different audiences um, is is something that is part of the developmental process and being able to write clearly um, to to, to be of interest to practitioners as well as other scholars is an important skill to learn. Um, so I think writing for, for EMJ in that respect uh, is, is a very good developmental uh, practice. And also with, um, with uh, research exercises that also, in, uh, also emphasize impact uh, thinking about the impact of your papers uh, is important too. Within the UK, um, in order to have an impact um, case study for our, our REF, um, our, um, we have to have a paper published already. And uh, papers that are have some uh, are very impactful uh, in that respect will be a good springboard from that. Uh, so things like that. I think it's how you put your promotion case or your, um, you know, your uh, appraisal case together. In that it's not. Re it's probably for many people not realistic to say that they will get, you know, four four star papers in a row. Um, and it, it's very much thinking about where where is the best audience of your paper. Yeah, uh, who do you want to talk to? Um, and if you want to talk to a, a broad generalist uh, audience um, and to practitioners who also engage in scholarly uh, activities, then EMJ is a good outlet for that. Yeah, I think from IGMR's perspective, you know, I, I, I'm so always surprised at just how many lists there are in different countries, you know, how many journal ranking lists there are and how the promotion prospects are different in very different countries. Uh, IGMR is a, a young journal, we're 20 years old, and I, our position on most of these lists doesn't really reflect the, our impact factor. You know, we've been consistently in the top 10, and we're currently the fifth in terms of impact factor. Um, so really, how would we convince scholars that, let's say, IGMR isn't an A on their particular list in their nation? Well, we have got a very high impact factor, so ultimately, all of us as researchers want our research to be read and cited. You know, that is the academics immortality. And you can achieve that with IGMR. You know, IGMR, the papers are very well read and very well cited, uh, irrespective of their ranking. You, you know, in most of the lists, the, the IGMR is positioned somewhere in the B list or just below the top category, uh, depending on, on which country you're looking at. So, but its impact factor is definitely very strong. So. So that would be the main, at the moment anyway, the main selling point that we would have for authors considering which journal to submit in terms of, of advancing their career. Thank you, Dermot. Um, I guess uh, there is in the chat, there is a question, maybe some of you have seen it, which is that uh, I guess the publication process suggests that uh, uh, the decision is entirely in the hands, so I'm, I'm reading, of a few individuals and given the
pressure that comes with large volume submissions, large volume of submissions. It's obvious the majority of these rejections are highly disputable. Uh, would you agree? Would you disagree? Um, again, it is a debate that comes up. I think uh, we need to address it. Uh, I think, I guess it's like democracy. Maybe our system is uh, the worst system we can think of, except for all others. Um, but what would you would you like to comment on this? And uh, it might be our last comment at this point. Yeah, I would I would like to comment. Um, I think it's important to remember that certainly on these journals, the editorial teams are, are very experienced. So they've been reviewing for the journals for a long time. There'll be an associate editor probably either for this journal or another journal. Then when they get to the point of being an editor in chief, they've, they've been doing this for a long time. And editors actually spend a huge amount of time looking really carefully at all the papers. We'll be, many of us will be long into the night, reading, 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 really, really carefully to look for what's good about a paper. I think what's important to remember here, two things. First of all, the editors are looking at this from the perspective of their journal. So the paper might be an interesting paper, like the example I gave about vaccinations, but it has to speak to JMS. It's got to be within our criteria. And if it isn't, then we can't take it further forward. The other thing is that we're all part, big journals have big teams. So if an editor was ever uncertain, they wouldn't hesitate to share their uh, concerns with another editor. So it's a very common thing uh, in JMS that somebody might think, I don't know what to make of this paper, and they all send it out to two or three other editors. So um, I think the process actually is, is very, very carefully worked out. A lot of careful thought goes into a paper um, and, and what's going to happen to it. And, and if it's rejected, there is probably a good reason for that. And it, the reason is to do with whether the paper is suitable for the journal. So as I've mentioned with JMS, and we had the very nice example from Anjali, if somebody's writing about trades unions, it has to be a paper that is comprehensible to a general readership. And if it's not, then it might be better going into a specialist journal. That, that would be an example. Um, but I think it is the case that the editors in, in big journals like these are actually very, they're very committed and they're very well resourced. So one nice thing about being editor is, an editor of JMS is I don't have to take a decision on my own. If there's anything to me that's unclear, I would always share with a colleague. Thank you. I, I just wanted to add, thank you, Caroline. I mean, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, this is a voluntary effort that all editors are doing. Reviews are entirely voluntary, but um, people who do this work do it because they care about good scholarship. And actually we are in the business of publishing great research. So um, there are many areas where papers are not ready for submission um, and we need to be honest about that. Um, there are many areas where a paper isn't necessarily a fit for a journal, but that does not mean it's not a fit for a journal. Um, we are all experienced authors, and I have been rejected several times by AMJ, um, you know, including after, well, always after revision opportunities. So I know what it feels like to have a paper not go forward. Um, every single person on an editorial uh, board uh, has that experience as well. And so I think um, when we make a decision, we are making a decision about what is the likelihood of this paper getting to the next level. Um, and we're also making a decision, you know, the large volume of papers just means we do spend a lot of time on these things, but the, it is spread out over the editorial group. We do exchange views on papers. I will often solicit the input of an associate editor who I know to be an expert in a particular area of theory and say, I just want your opinion, you know, is this novel enough? Um, and we go back and forth on it a couple of times. So um, the decisions aren't taken lightly um, and having the large volume of papers flow through, um, it's just like when you're marking student papers, um, you don't see or they don't see the variety of what you see. When you have seen enough papers, you have a strong sense, an experienced sense of what, you know, has a likelihood of going over well with reviewers and what, what will struggle to go over well with reviewers. And so um, 
I'm not defending that every rejected paper, um, you know, might not have been deserving at some point, uh, but it, it's deserving in some journal. And um, I was taught years ago by Bill Starbuck, my former colleague at the University of Oregon, um, you know, when you read a rejection, when you read people's comments on your work, um, it can get very emotional, but you need to put yourself in their shoes and in their chair and think about what is it that they're trying to convey. And ultimately what they're conveying is they don't understand what you've tried to tell them and take that on face value and take that as an authentic opportunity to help you improve your work. You might have to put it away in the drawer until you can read it non-emotionally, but once you can do that, I think that's some of the best advice I've gotten from someone who I think is quite well respected and a little bit of a maverick in our field too. So thanks for your question. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry, but I think we need to end here. I've been told that we had to stick with our, our schedule. Otherwise we get cut off in a very rude way, which I wouldn't want uh, to happen to us. Uh, so thank you very much to our four panelists. I think this was uh, very enlightening. Um, so thank you for sharing uh, your experience, your views on the journals, and uh, well, I think uh, you'll get a few more submissions that you probably don't need because you're already uh, submerged with them, but uh, thank you for, for being with us, and uh, thank you to all the participants for joining in, in this panel. So thank you, and uh, please enjoy the conference.